Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. My name is Roberta Watson, and on behalf of Jefferson's Office of Alumni Relations, I'd like to welcome you. We're so excited to have one of our wonderful faculty members, Dr. Travis Polin uh, from the Department of Exercise Science joining us. He's an expert in all things moving. So um, he'll give a little bit more detail on his background and I don't wanna give too much away. Um, but before I pass it over to Travis, uh, just wanted to let you know, we will hear from him during his presentation and then we'll be having about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A with um, Travis. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screens. And if you don't see that, um, try moving your mouse and it should appear. Uh, but feel free to submit those throughout the presentation and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, so with those housekeeping items, Travis, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Roberta. All right, let's share this screen. All right, so I am Travis. My pronouns are he and him. And I was asked to speak tonight about maintaining health and fitness during the winter months. And I thought, what better way to do that than to talk about strength training? Because especially if you're in the Northeast, uh, the winter months were mostly confined to exercising indoors and strength training is a really great option at this time. So a little bit about me. I am an exercise science professor at Jefferson University. I just celebrated my one year work anniversary and I teach courses for our undergraduate program in, I, I teach exercise psychology, I teach exercise prescription. And then on top of teaching, I also do research on athletic injuries. I have a master's degree in biomechanics and my doctorate is in rehabilitation sciences. And I've also been a personal trainer since 2013. I have lots of experience training general population clients of all ages, as well as athletes. And so my goal with this presentation is just to share what I've found that works really well when designing workouts. To get us started, I just want to get the pulse on what people's experiences are with strength training. So you can go ahead and scan this QR code with your phone. So just go to your camera and hover over that image and it should pull the uh, QR code up and link you to the poll. You can also go to pollev.com and enter Travis Pollen 267 so i will give you a couple more seconds to get on there uh, this information will be on the next slide too so you'll still be able to scan from there so the question is do you currently strength trade and the two options are yes or no and i'm going to activate that poll now okay so it's already activated and it looks like we're getting about a 50-50 mix maybe with a, a little extra push on the yes. The no's were creeping up. Uh, okay, so we have a, a decent mix of people with and without experience, which is helpful for me to know. So back to our PowerPoint here. Our objectives for this talk are to First, start by thinking about what your own goals and needs are from a strength training standpoint. Then to compare and contrast uh, this idea of training muscles versus training movements, which we'll get a lot more into in a few slides. Then identifying the best exercise variations for you. And finally, learning to design your own personalized strength training program. So we'll start with that first objective the idea of training goals and needs. So the first thing to think about this with this is what your training age is. And there are three broad classifications, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Beginners are typically considered people who have been strength training for less than two months. They often, or they typically train about one to two times a week. And the stress of that training is usually somewhat low. 
That can be contrasted with intermediates who've been training for about two to six months. They're generally training about two to three times a week and the training stress is medium. And then you might be considered advanced if you've been training for a year or more. You train over three or four days a week and your training stress is high. So with those categorizations in mind, I have another poll question here, which is how would you classify your training age? Would you consider yourself a beginner, less than two months, intermediate, two to six months, or advanced? So you can hit up the same poll and uh, or the same QR code link and then answer that question. So it looks like we have mostly beginners with dark horse intermediate, uh, intermediate maybe creeping up a little bit and no advanced. So you're in the right place because this is more of a, a beginner to intermediate talk. Okay, cool. So let's go back here. So first things first is training age. And most of you, it sounds like are beginner or intermediate. Second thing to think about is, uh, oh, and I also want to mention here, like, no worries if you are a beginner, because it's actually a really cool place to be because you have the most to gain. So somebody who's more advanced, they're going to make smaller gains, whereas a beginner can make really big strides with more um, wiggle room. Like the, the training program doesn't have to be perfect because beginners just have a lot of room to grow. So the next thing to think about in terms of training goals and needs is whether you are safe to participate in exercise. And there's a handy series of seven questions that you can ask yourself. Uh, the questionnaire is called the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire or PAR-Q. And the questions have to do with things like heart, whether you have a heart condition, whether you have pain in your chest when you exercise or pain, chest pain in the last month. If you lose your balance or have lost consciousness, if you have a bone or joint problem, blood, high blood pressure or another heart condition or any other reason why you should not do physical activity. So if you answer no to all those questions, then you can be reasonably sure that you are safe to exercise and you have a low risk of complications that could occur from exercise. But if you do answer yes to one or more of those questions, you should talk to your doctor first before starting to become more physically active. It's not to say that if you answer yes to any of those questions, you can't exercise. You just want to get the green light from your doctor and then find out if there's anything uh, that you need to be careful about when you are exercising. So that's step two. From there, we can start to think about whether we have any current or previous injuries. And this will help to determine whether there's anything, if you think of the menu of options when it comes to training, whether there's anything that's off the table or whether anything is, everything is on the table. Uh, usually, you know, even if you have an injury, there's still plenty that you can do to work around those things. Also something to think about is when the last time you exercised was, and we call this training status. Uh, so have you been exercising regularly? Has it been a few months? Has it been a few years? Have you never exercised at all? Then you want to think about what your goals are. So what do you want to be able to do and how can exercise help you get there? So are there certain activities that you want to be able to do or movements that you want to be able to do? Maybe it's getting up and down off the floor easier to play with grandkids. Uh, so just think about what your goals are relative to what you're currently able to do and what you would need from a training program in order to reach those goals. Then you can think about what you're good at and what you are not so good at. And that can help to determine what you need to be working on. So it, it's nice to include a healthy mix of things that you're good at to uh, increase your confidence, but also working on the things that you're not so good at too. Then you can think about what exercises you already know that you like and what exercises you know that you dislike. And again, maybe it's uh, uh, including a mix of both of these things. Uh, so of course, you could tip the scales towards things that you like because the more that you enjoy the exercise that, do, that you're doing, the more likely you are to actually do it. But sometimes including those things that you dislike too could be those things that you're not as good at and it could be beneficial for you. 
And then how much time can you commit to training? So can you commit one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, six days a week? What, what is it? And then you can work backwards from there. And finally, what equipment do you have access to? Do you have access to a fully equipped gym? Do you have access to just your own body weight? Or do you have some dumbbells, kettlebells, resistance bands lying around at home that you can use to build your workout? So after you've gone through that mental exercise, then the next stage is to start thinking about which exercises you might choose. And the way that most people go about this is they think about what muscles they want to train. So they will want to train their chests, their shoulders, their abs. Uh, and when we think about these muscles, we often tend to overemphasize the ones that we can see in the mirror. So chest, biceps, abs, quads. And we often will underemphasize the muscles on the back of our body. So mostly back muscles, also hamstrings and glutes in the lower body. So what I would like to suggest is a paradigm shift from thinking about training muscles to training movements. And there's a quote from a famous strength coach named Vern Gambetta. He said, if you train movements, you never miss muscles, but the converse is not necessarily true. So in reality, it doesn't have to be an either or where you're only thinking about muscles or you're only thinking about movements. It can be both, but I would recommend thinking about movements first and then muscles. So when I'm talking about movements, I'm talking about things like pushing objects or pulling objects and also squatting, hinging, rotating, and locomotion. And we're going to go through examples of each of these now one by one. So when I'm talking about pushing, I'm talking about exercises where you're pushing a weight away from your body. You could be pushing it more in a vertical direction. You could be pushing it more in a horizontal direction, like the floor press, floor press or you could be pushing your body away from a stationary object like a push-up, maybe a push-up on the floor or a push-up on an incline bench. And these would be exercises where you're primarily working your chest, your deltoids or shoulder muscles, and your triceps on the back of your upper arm. Then we can think about the opposite muscle for the upper body or the opposite movement for the upper body, which would work the opposite muscles, which would be pulling. So pulling yourself towards a fixed attachment point, like with this suspension trainer row, or doing a pull-up where you're hanging from a bar and you're pulling your body up. So that would be more of a vertical direction of motion. The row would be more of a horizontal direction of motion. And then we have another example here called a face pull, which is kind of like a row, but you're keeping your elbows up higher and you might be using a cable system for that. So these exercises would be primarily for your back, your biceps, your rhomboids, and your trapezius, which are muscles in between your shoulder blades. So that's the upper body, and it can really be that simple. We can move to the lower body now and talk about squats and lunges, which we would call knee-dominant exercises because they are mostly characterized by deep movement of the knees, as well as deep range of motion of the hip too. So you have things like a goblet squat, where you're holding a weight at your chest. You have things like lunges, uh, where you're stepping back. You could also do forward lunges, and you have things like step-ups. Uh, and all of these exercises would be primarily working the quadriceps, which are the muscles on the fronts of your thighs. And then we can contrast that with exercises that are more hip dominant, uh, which are more focused on extending the hip. So you can see with each of these exercises, there's not a ton of knee bend, but there is a lot of hip bend. So we call these exercises hip hinges, and examples would be things like deadlifts, broad jumps, single leg deadlifts, and cable pull-throughs. So all of these movements would be working the muscles uh, of the backs of the legs. So the hamstrings on the backs of the thighs, the gluteal muscles, and then the spinal erectors. So we call those muscles, those three muscles, the posterior chain, posterior meaning back of the body. We also have a category of exercises called locomotion. So these are exercises where you are moving around. So the previous two slides, the exercises, you were mostly standing still, except in the case of maybe a walking lunge. 
But here we're doing exercises where we're moving from one place to another. So we're pushing a sled, we're carrying heavy weights in our hands, or maybe we're crawling on all fours across the floor. And then we have a category of exercises called rotation. And these are primarily core exercises where we are rotating side to side. Uh, so these could be things like this angled bar rotation, throwing a medicine ball, or performing the, this cable exercise where the person is chopping diagonally across their body from high to low. We then have a category of exercises, and this is really the last category, which I call resist. And these are exercises where you're actually trying to avoid movement. So things like bird dogs, side planks, and dead bugs. Bird dogs, we're trying to resist the tendency to rotate our torso when we raise an opposite arm and leg. Side plank, we're trying to keep that nice straight line from knees to head while engaging the obliques. And then the dead bug, we're trying to keep our lower back pressed into the ground as we alternately lower opposite arm and leg. So again, all of these, we're trying to resist the unwanted motion uh, in the presence of moving our arms and legs in the case of the bird dog and the dead bug, or just staying perfectly still in the side plank. So again, it doesn't have to be that you're only thinking about muscles or you're only thinking about movements. You can be thinking about both, but I like to think about the, the movements because I think it's easier to conceptualize these. And when you're doing all of these movements, you're definitely hitting all of the muscles and you might be doing it in a more well-balanced way. Last but not least, I do have a supplemental miscellaneous category that I call everything else. And these would just be exercises that don't fit neatly into those other six categories. So these would be things like working the rotator cuff or working the lower leg like calf raises, or maybe working the outer hip or maybe working on your grip. So these are smaller, more isolated movements that are focused on one muscle or a smaller group of muscles in particular. So those are basically exercises in a nutshell, and I have a three-step process for choosing which ones to do. The first step is to pick the number of exercises that you're going to do in a given session. The second step is to choose which movement patterns you're going to focus on. And the third step is to choose which variations of those movement patterns you'll do and which implements or which equipment that you'll use. And so I'm gonna go through each of these steps in a little bit more detail now. The first step is to choose your exercises. And usually this is going to be, it, it can vary. Um, you could do as few as two or three exercises for a shorter session. Maybe you have 20 minutes or you could do eight, 10, 12 or more exercises if you have an hour. And it, of course it depends how many times you repeat those exercises, but the number of exercises generally is going to depend on how much time you have. When you have, uh, a shorter workout, you want to focus on what I call primary exercises. So these would be exercises that are working multiple joints at a time, working larger muscles, and that you can use or work up to a fairly heavy weight. So that's what I mean by high loading capacity. And you would choose a few of these primary exercises in a given workout. And then if you have time, you could do accessory exercises or assistance exercises. So these would be exercises where you're just focusing on movement at one joint, you're working smaller muscles, and you're not going to be using as heavy a weight. These accessory exercises are nice to have, but they're not necessarily need to have. So if you just have a short amount of time, you would focus on the primary exercises. But if you have more time, you can also include a few accessory exercises. The next step is to choose your movement patterns. And this choice is based on a principle called specificity, which says that we adapt to the demands that we impose on our bodies. So with that in mind, we should choose movement patterns that are specific to our goals, the activities that we want to be able to do, and the things that we're weak at. So the truth is that almost everyone does those same seven basic movement patterns in their activities of daily living or in sports if they play sports. So the differences between workout design from one person to the other, whether it's a male or a female or a younger or an older person or a more beginner or a more advanced person 
are really more in degree, not in kind. So you don't have to totally reinvent the wheel uh, from one person to the next if they have different target activities or different goals. Uh, the specificity comes more in the specific variations of these movement patterns that the person chooses, as well as the particular parameters of the exercises, which we'll get into later in the presentation. So one easy trick for designing a full body workout is to choose one exercise from each of the seven categories. So you would have one upper body push, one upper body pull, one squat or lunge, one hip hinge, one locomotion exercise, one rotation exercise, and one resisting exercise. So before I go any further, I'm curious to know if you are currently strength training, and uh, I'm going to talk more about the difference between the body part split and the full body training on the next slide. Uh, but if you are currently engaging in one of these, which are you doing? Are you doing a full body split or, uh, or sorry, are you doing full body training or are you doing a body part split? So you can go ahead and answer that poll question. And maybe you're doing either because you're new and that's perfectly okay too. So it looks like we have the, the most people responding full body training, followed by new to this, followed by the body part split. So um, you've read my mind because I'm, I'm going to make the case for full body training. And it looks like I won't have to argue too hard on that front. So uh, again, when you're choosing your movement patterns, you can either do full body training or split training. And like I said, a full body workout can be as simple as choosing one exercise from each of the movement categories. And the benefits of this is that it's really good for people who are really interested in gaining strength. It gives you a bit more attention to the back of the body and the lower body. It allows you to train each muscle group more frequently, and it is should promote less soreness. And it is a bit more practical if you tend to be somebody who misses sessions. And last but not least, this is kind of a joke, but not really, you're less likely to skip leg day because leg day is every day. So you can contrast that, oops, you can contrast that with split training. So split training would be more oriented for people who are interested in physique or bodybuilding or muscle growth. And in this case, you would be giving equal attention to each muscle group as opposed to each movement pattern. This might allow for more volume, more sets and reps per muscle group within a given session. Uh, and that might make you more sore, which maybe you like to be sore. So that would be a good option. Or maybe you don't like to be sore, in which case training your whole body might be more desirable. And the split training idea may also require more time in the gym. So if you do decide to split train, maybe you do a two-day split uh, where you're doing upper body and lower body split or pushing and pulling split. Or maybe you have a three-day split where you're doing upper one day, lower one day, and full body one day, or pushing exercises, pulling exercises, and full body on the three different days. Or maybe you alternate back and forth over the span of four days. So these splits would be more movement pattern-based, whereas a typical body part split would be chest and triceps on Monday, back and biceps on Tuesday, legs and shoulders on Thursday or, or whatever the days that you're working out. And this is what I most commonly see in beginners. Um, and it comes from the bodybuilding world, but the truth is that most people are not bodybuilders. So my preference is for full body training because I think that it allows people to better reach their goals if their goals are more oriented on uh, this left side of the column. As a person does become more advanced, maybe they do decide to opt for uh, one of these splits or a body part split. So I mentioned two day, three day, and four day splits. How do you know how many days per week to exercise? Well, this is really a, a logistical question that depends on your availability. So how many days can you devote to exercise? But it also can depend on your training age. So if you're a beginner, I typically recommend two or three days a week, although you can get away with one day a week too and still make progress. But if you're intermediate, I would suggest three to four days a week. Uh, and we don't have to worry about advanced because I don't think anybody on this webinar is advanced. And then the last consideration is for your recovery ability. So how 
able are you and how quickly do you recover from workouts? Typically for beginners, I, I really recommend that they don't do two sessions in a row, especially if they tend to get sore from one session to the next. So allowing for a day or two in between is helpful. But ultimately, if you have fewer sessions per week, that means that you're going to have to stick more to the basic exercises. Whereas if you have more sessions per week, then that gives you a little bit more opportunity to include those accessory exercises. So that's how you choose the movement patterns. Then the next step is to choose the variations of those movement patterns. So I have a few examples of this for different movement patterns. In this example, we're looking at pushing exercises that these are all push-up variations, uh, but this is would be an example of that upper body pushing category where you're pushing in a horizontal direction. So I have different stages here. So if you're a beginner, maybe you're doing your push-ups on the wall. If you're more intermediate, then maybe you're doing your push-ups on a lower incline or on the floor. And then when you get to be advanced, you maybe can add some weight on your back or you could also elevate your legs. So this idea of a continuum, we are going from uh, something that's, gravity assisted by working on a wall to something just body weight to actually adding load to this movement. And we can do the same approach for pulling exercises. So these are all examples of pull-up variations. Here, our feet are on the ground and we're doing, a, it's called an Australian pull-up or an inverted row. That would be a good beginner exercise. You can uh, tinker with the height of the bar if you are more upright, it's easier. If you're more inverted, it's harder. And then you can progress to doing exercises like uh, this weight-assisted pull-up or uh, the Gravitron machine. So the woman has her feet on this platform. She pin selects the weight to determine how much weight she wants to offload. And then she can pull up just a percentage of her body weight. Once she builds up to the strength to doing a pull-up with her own body weight, she can work there up to adding more uh, weight to the person's body uh, to go over a body weight pull up. And that would be a, an advanced version. So that's the upper body. With the lower body, the idea is basically the same. We're going from using assistance. So in this case, the woman is holding on to a TRX, could also just hold on to a pole. Uh, and so she's using her arms to assist her in that squat uh, while she's relying on her legs as much as she can. You could then progress from there to sitting down to a box, which would help keep your uh, depth consistent and give you uh, allow you to take a break at the bottom, to then working on just body weight squats, to adding load to the squats, to adding different types of load to the squats, uh, whether it's a dumbbell or a barbell and so on. This progression looks similar if you're doing an exercise like a lunge, uh, or a split squat. So in this case, again, person's holding on to a suspension trainer while they're stepping back into their lunge. And once they get good with that, they can progress to uh, body weight, to adding dumbbells, to adding a barbell. And maybe they start by stepping backwards and they progress to stepping forwards. And then maybe when in the advanced case, they're even walking across a room. So uh, again, all of these things are just based on your training age whether you're more beginner, intermediate, advanced, how recently you've exercised, and what your current ability level is. So you can always start at the beginner stage, and then once you feel comfortable, progress up the continuum. So those are the, the squats and lunges. This is an example of a deadlift or hip hinge. So with the beginner, we're just focusing on drilling that movement pattern. So trying to keep the back nice and flat as we're sending the hips back. We can add some load behind the back in a way that reinforces that flat back position. And then we can build up to adding weight in the case of the kettlebell deadlift to this hex bar or trap bar deadlift to then a barbell deadlift. So the, all the same exercise, it's just a hip hinge or a deadlift, but the way that you add load and the, the type of load that you use dictates the degree of difficulty and uh, where the person, you know, whether where their training age is, where their status is, where their ability is, helps them determine where they should start on that continuum. So just to recap, uh, we want to be choosing the number of exercises based on our session length, choosing the movement patterns based on specificity. A nice trick is just to include one of each of the seven categories, 
but maybe a training split would be appropriate for somebody who's more advanced and then choosing the variations or the implements based on the person's training history, status, and ability. So that is exercise selection in 20 minutes. Uh, we can go further and uh, look at some rules for organizing the exercises over the course of the workout. So let's say that you've already picked the exercises that you're going to be doing. How do you decide where to sequence them over the course of your 20 or 60 minutes or whatever? So the idea behind this is that we are, when we walk into the gym or walk into our training session, uh, once we've warmed up, we are at our peak preparedness. So we're, we're feeling our best. And as we go, our preparedness drains like a bag of sand that's been punctured. So we want to be putting our primary exercises towards the beginning of the workout, our accessory exercises later in the workout, and then maybe doing some conditioning and cool down at the end. So each of these principles or rules for exercise order basically boil down to uh, that principle of putting the harder, heavier, more complex stuff towards the beginning of the workout. So we can start with the idea of doing primary exercises before accessory exercises. So this would be an example here where we're doing our squats, which are a multi-joint exercise. We're moving at the knees and at the hips. We can even be holding weight, which we can contrast with this accessory exercise, which are uh, an exercise for the backs of the shoulder, uh, the rotator cuff, smaller muscles, um, which we wouldn't be going as heavy on. So we want to be putting our primary exercises earlier in our workout and our accessory exercises later in the workout. Relatedly, kind of the similar idea, doing our multi-joint exercises before our single joint exercises. So with the pull-up, we're moving at the elbows and at the shoulders. So this is working the biceps and the lats, whereas this bicep curl is just working the biceps. So we're only moving at the elbows. So we would want to put our pull-ups earlier in the workout and our curls later in the workout. Also on a related note, we have bigger muscles before smaller muscles. So the deadlift works the hamstrings and the glutes and the low back. So we would be wanting to be do this exercise earlier in the workout than doing this exercise later in the workout, which is just working the grip uh, or forearm muscles. Doing strength exercises, or sorry, doing power exercises before doing strength exercises. This is more of a, a safety idea, perhaps, because uh, let's say that the uh, the power exercise, in this case, it's a broad jump, but let's say we were doing a box jump where we were jumping up on a box. You wouldn't want to do that later in the workout because you might miss the box and then you could scrape your shin. Um, but in any case, we're going to get the most out of our power exercises if we do them earlier in the workout. So doing exercises like jumping before doing strength exercises like a deadlift. Strength before endurance. So wanting to do exercises we're going to, where we're going to be using heavier weights before doing exercises where we're going to be using lighter weights or just body weight that we're going to be holding for a longer time or doing more reps. And then, because otherwise you would tire yourself out doing these endurance exercises if you then, and then as you, if you did these earlier in the workout and then went into the strength exercises later. And last but not least, skilled before unskilled. So this is just the idea, like, let's say you're doing an exercise where you're standing on one leg. There's some balance involved in that. There's high concentration. Uh, we would call that skilled. So you would want to do that exercise before working your calves. Um, because if you fatigue your calves first and then go to do the balance exercise, it's going to be trickier. So those are our rules for exercise order. I do have rules in quotations because once you know the rules, you can break the rules, but it's good to start with the rules uh, and know them before you then later decide to break them. So our next uh, thing that we can think about is whether we're doing straight sets or paired sets. And what I mean by straight sets is doing the same exercise repeatedly before moving on to the next exercise as compared to pairing exercises where you're alternating back and forth between two or three or more exercises. So there are a bunch of different types of pairings, which I'll talk about over the next few slides, but I'm curious to know if you are engaging in strength training at the moment, do you typically do straight sets or do you do supersets? So again, straight sets would be doing the same exercise repeatedly before moving on to the next one. Supersets would be where you're 
going back and forth between a couple of sets or a couple of different exercises. So it looks like between straight sets and supersets, supersets had the early advantage, uh, but straight sets is taking the lead. So my vote here is for supersets. And the reason that I prefer supersets is because I find that it saves time because when you're doing work, let's say you're doing two exercises, A and B, as you're doing exercise B, that can sort of serve as active rest from the first exercise, as opposed to just sitting around or scrolling Instagram or whatever. Um, and I also find that it helps spread out the fatigue better. So if you're alternating back and forth between say an upper body and a lower body exercise, then uh, you can basically spread out that fatigue so that you're not just going lower body, lower body, lower body over and over. So let's go through each of these different types of pairings. You can do alternating sets. So this would be upper body and lower body. So in this case, I have a deadlift paired with a push-up. So deadlift is for the lower body, push-up is for the upper body. And we would go, we would do a set of deadlifts, then do a set of push-ups, and then we would rest. And then we would go back and repeat from the top, deadlifts, then push-ups, then rest for the desired number of sets or rounds. So that's alternating between upper and lower. You can also do supersets, which are a push and a pull. So in this case, we have a uh, angled bar press, which is a push complemented with a TRX row, which is a pull. Uh, sometimes you hear supersets, you, that word used to refer to all of these different pairings, but from a strictly uh, exercise science standpoint, the superset is really a push and a pull. You could then do compound sets, which would be two similar movements. So in this case, I have the reverse lunge paired with the squat. Um, with the, uh, the alternating sets and the supersets, you're really trying to spread out the fatigue. But in this case, you're trying to create more and more fatigue in the lower body because you're doing two similar exercises back to back. So this might be more uh, better for more intermediate exercisers. You can do contrast sets, which would be two similar movements. In this case, we have a deadlift and a broad jump. And here's an example where I'm doing the strength exercise before the power exercise. Uh, there's a scientific principle called post-activation potentiation, uh, which dictates that if you do a strength exercise followed by a power exercise, you'll actually get more out of the power exercise. So you'll actually jump farther that way. So we've broken that rule uh, where I said before that you should uh, do power before strength, but this is an example of a time when you could break it. And then we have active recovery. Uh, it, the example here would be doing pull-ups, which is our uh, heavy hitter, followed by this lateral band walk for the outer hip. And this would be the accessory exercise. It's going to be minimally fatiguing for those upper body muscles. So it's a nice active rest. Or you could do a combination of the above. So in this tri set, this set of three exercises, we have a lower body step up, an upper body uh, floor press, and then a face pull. So this upper body and lower body would be an alternating set, but this push and pull would be a super set. So we can combine these three into this little circuit. So once we've chosen our exercise order and how we're going to pair the exercises, we just have to figure out how many reps, sets, rest we're going to do. So I'll go through each of these one by one, reps, load, sets, and uh, rest. Uh, and just to let you know, volume, you sometimes hear that word, is just the combination of sets and reps. So if you do three sets of 10 reps, then your volume would be 30 repetitions. So from a repetition standpoint, there are four basic um, places that you can work or ranges that you can work in. You can work in the strength range, which is lower reps, also power. Strength and power are both like two to six reps, let's say. You could work more in the hypertrophy rep range, which is anywhere from six to 12 repetitions. And then you could work more in the muscular endurance range, which is anywhere from uh, 12 to 15 to 20 or more. And I, I typically recommend for beginners to stick to a more moderate rep range, like maybe eight to 12 or maybe six to 12. You can do any exercise for any number of reps, but some exercises are better geared towards lower reps, like deadlifts, for example. And some exercises are more geared towards higher reps, like uh, face pulls, for example, for the backs of the shoulders. But it really depends on your goal. So if you're more interested in strength, then you're going to go lower reps. 
you're more interested in muscle growth, maybe this higher repetition or moderate repetition range is going to be best uh, for that logistically. And then if you're more interested in endurance, then you can go into that higher repetition range. The load is really going to be dictated by the reps. So let's say that you've chosen that your goal repetition range is eight to 12 reps. Well, you can start by picking a lightweight and do a set and you can adjust from there. So if the set felt hard, then you're, and you were able to do that, those eight to 10 reps, but no more then that's perfect. If you could have done a lot more than those 10 reps, then you can call that set a warm up, and you can add weight and adjust from there. So it can really be that simple start light, see how it feels. And if you're overshooting or undershooting your, your goal repetition range for your target adaptation, whether it's strength or, or hypertrophy muscle growth, then you can adjust from there for Sets, we can do anywhere from two to six is usually the recommendation. As you can see, three is kind of included in all of these things. But if your goal is strength, then two to six sets is usually good. Power, kind of similar. Hypertrophy, maybe three to six sets. And endurance, two to three sets. And finally, rest is basically dictated by what your de desired adaptation is. So if you're training for strength, you're going to need more rest. If you're training for endurance, you're going to need less rest. And it kind of coincides with that idea of primary and accessory, where your primary exercises you're going to need more rest from and your accessory exercises you're going to need less rest from. So in my last few minutes, I just have a couple of examples here. So the first example is a 28-year-old female ex-athlete who has no formal resistance training, no injuries. Her goal is to get stronger. She already is pretty good with muscular endurance, flexibility, and balance. Her weaknesses are strength and power. She likes body weight exercises and training her abs. She doesn't have anything that she dislikes. And she trains uh, or she wants to train two days a week for about 45 minutes a session in a fully equipped gym. So you can see here an example of the exercises. First of all, the movement categories. Second of all, the exercises and third, the sets and reps that I might recommend for this person. So it's basically a mix of the things that she likes and the things that she needs because she's a beginner. The exercises are fairly simple, um, but because she's an ex-athlete, we can in include some explosive type exercises uh, because she has no injuries. Everything is on the table. Um, that of course is not always the case with everybody, um, but we can really focus on her strength and her power. Uh, we can keep those repetitions kind of on the lower side, five to eight, maybe 10. We've included a mix of body weight exercises and core exercises, which we know that she likes. And uh, everything is alternating between upper and lower body to try to spread that fatigue out. And she'll be able to do these six exercises in less than 45 minutes. Second example is a 38-year-old male desk worker who has done exercises class exercise classes before, but no formal strength training. His goals are to improve body composition and get stronger. He uh, says that his upper body is strong, but his lower body is weak. He also likes upper body. He doesn't dislike anything. His availability is the same as the previous case, and he has access to a decent amount of equipment. So the program for him might look like this. Again, a mix of doing things that he likes and things that he needs. Uh, he will definitely get stronger because we're prioritizing this lower repetition range, six to eight. Uh, combined with proper diet, he will improve his body composition. Uh, we're working both his upper body and his lower body in all of the workouts. Again, doing alternating sets between upper and lower to spread out the fatigue. And he should be able to do this in less than 45 minutes. So my last thought here is just that there's a ton of fancy things that you can do much fancier than what I've shown on in the two previous examples or any of the exercises that I've shown. But most people do really well with just the basics because the more you complicate things, the harder it is to stick to them. So you have to ask yourself uh, when you are scrolling through fitness Instagram channels and you're seeing a lot of complicated things, will those things really help you or can you just stick to the basics? So to summarize, your goals and your needs really are what dictate the training program. If you think about movements first and muscles second, then that'll make sure that you get a really balanced workout. You can use those exercise pairings and ordering ideas to help you maximize the effectiveness of your workouts. The sets, reps, load, and rest that you do will dictate what adaptation you have to the training. And there are lots of fancier techniques, but doing the basics gives you a lot of bang for your buck. 
So uh, here's the reference that I uh, use or ha has inspired a lot of the information in this talk in, in combination with my 10 years of experience, personal training. Um, if you are wanting to get more into the these topics, I have a, a previous recording of this talk on YouTube. Uh, so you, you're welcome to watch that link. I know this talk is also going to be recorded. If you'd like to reach me, uh, feel free to check out my website or you can email me. And I also am sharing one additional resource, which is a database of exercises um, with YouTube links associated. So if you click this link, you'll be able to make your own copy of the file in Google Sheets. And it has, I can show you what it looks like. It has over 1700 exercises, which is totally um, uh, in contrast to what I just said about sticking to the basics. But these are all the exercises that I've ever prescribed to a client. Um, so you can go in here and see all the exercises, see all the YouTube links. And I, you can also design your own workout program uh, with these tabs. And the uh, spreadsheet, uh, the database on the first tab is linked to the rest of the days. So you can go in here and scroll through the exercises. You could also type in squat into the box and find all of the different squat variations that I have ever offered to a client. So with that, I uh, am finished the slides and I'm happy to answer any questions for the remaining time that we have together. Okay. Thank you so much, Travis. That was super informative and a great place to get us started. Um, just a little, a little update for our guests. We will be sure to share these links with you in a follow-up email tomorrow. And um, we'll also share it with the recording for this. So you will receive those links um, at the end of the presentation. Um, but it looks like a number of you are already submitting your questions. So thank you for doing that. Um, let's start out with a question about um, the gym. So um, it looks like one of you is interested in uh, the gym has a variety of burn or cardio classes that use jumping jacks or other cardio with dumbbells. Um, would that be similar to what you were discussing? Yeah. So I've seen those classes and I've actually taken one of those classes before too. That would not be altogether dissimilar, That, but it would be more of a of a cardio stimul stimulus as a as opposed to a training stimulus. So what you might expect out of a class like that would be you would be going pretty pretty nonstop. So there wouldn't be a ton of rest. Um, you would probably be holding relatively lighter weights, and so you would be working more in that endurance part of that repetition range where you would be building more muscle endurance as opposed to be doing strength to be building more strength. You would also be definitely getting some cardiovascular benefits. Um, so it's a nice uh, compromise, let's say, where you can get some strength because you are holding weights, um, but it is going to be more of a cardiovascular endurance type of uh, uh, stimulus. So uh, whereas what I'm recommending more is like, okay, do this exercise, then maybe do this other exercise and then rest for two minutes. Uh, like they wouldn't offer that opportunity for rest in a class like that. I wouldn't expect. Perfect. And, um, we, we had another alum that's interested in the, I'm not sure if this is right. NYT or night nine, um, minute. I think it's New York times, actually New York times. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so have you heard about that? And, and do you think it's a good option? Yeah. So it's funny Years ago, they put out a seven minute workout. And then I, I, I guess more recently, they've put out a nine minute workout. Uh, these are good options for people, especially for beginners. I think that they they do hit a lot of the, the movement patterns that I recommend people do. It is a more minimalist approach, right? So if maybe my recommendation was you could get a lot done doing two or three exercises over the span of 20 minutes they're saying you can get a lot done in nine minutes. But again, it's going to be higher intensity. There's not going to be a lot of opportunity to rest during those nine minutes. It'll be more of a circuit-based training. So maybe you're doing 45 seconds of squats, resting yeah. for 15 seconds, then transitioning into 45 seconds of push-ups, resting for 15 seconds. So inevitably, 
something is going to be better than nothing. So I, I think that the, those nine minute, those short intense workouts are great. Uh, but they're not going to provide exactly the same stimulus as spending a good 20 or minutes or an hour where you're getting plenty of rest in between exercises and going as you know heavy as is re- relatively reasonable for you. Right. That's good advice. And maybe something that people can build around. Um, so another question on um, kind of designing your own workout. Um, how does one decide the amount of weight to use? Right. So, so I, I kind of breezed through this, but it's really about the adaptation that you're after. So if you want to get stronger, then that means that you have to use heavier weights and it means that you have to do fewer repetitions. So a good rule of thumb would be that if you if your primary goal is strength, then you need to choose an exercise or you need to choose a weight that's so heavy that you can't do more than five or six reps. So what that boils down to is, okay, well, if my goal is to, to do four to six reps, let's say I'm going to give myself a range and I pick a weight that I can only do two reps of, then it was too heavy. If I pick a weight where I get to six, but I could have done eight or I could have done 10, or I do do eight or 10, then that means it's too light. And so it, it can be, it can really be as simple as that, like trial and error, uh, of picking a, a lighter, you know, err on the side of lighter, pick a lightweight, and then see how it feels and progress from there. Um, it, it can be more complicated if you want to test your one repetition maximum, and then you can start getting into percentage-based training, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, we don't have much time left, so I'm going to ask one more question, and then we still haven't gotten to a few, so just want to let the audience know if we haven't gotten to your questions, what I'm going to do is provide the questions to Travis after this talk, and he'll get me responses that I can then send out to you. So um, rest assured, be rest assured, you will get your questions answered. It just might not be live during this session. Um, So our last live question. For those with injuries, um, potentially, you know, in their shoulders, or um, I know we have some alumni that have injuries in their knees, things like that. Um, Is there, you know, anything that you would recommend something maybe like more low impact, like where should they start if something like push-ups might hurt? Right. So, so like you said, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, hips, backs, like these are very common musculoskeletal complaints. And the, the good news in my experience, working with people with all sorts of aches and pains is that there's always something that you can do, um, but you do have to sometimes get creative. So if you think back to those continuums that I showed of, you know, exercises more for beginners up to exercises more for advanced people, um, you would want to err on the side of the beginner exercises that are, uh, body weight, or maybe even offloading yourself some way. So orienting your body in a way that uh, you're you're taking some of the gravity away, or you're maybe you're using your hands to help you in a lower body exercise. Also in conjunction, you know, especially with the shoulders and with the knees, it's about working through the ranges of motion that are not causing pain. So starting with ranges of motion and with loads that you can handle comfortably. And oftentimes these things like doing those doing exercises that you're pain-free in through the ranges of motion you can tolerate with the loads that you can tolerate, you can build from there to increasing loads, increasing range of motion uh, to the point where maybe you can do push-ups. But if you just, you know, if you start out and you can't do push-ups and you throw yourself on the floor and keep trying, um, that's that's not going to necessarily work out in a really progressive way. So finding the version of the exercise that you can currently do, practicing that and then over time, you know, two, four, six, eight weeks building up from there, uh, with, in terms of the load and in terms of the, uh, complexity or challenge of the exercise. Okay. That's great. Great to know. And like, I'm thinking, I know you have a background in working with swimmers. So like, maybe like get in the pool, like go out and and do some things that way. Yeah. The pool is a great option, especially, uh, for older adults, especially if, you know, land-based exercises are painful for you. Uh, the pool is lighter impact, but at the same time, 
that doing those exercises on land, even if it's just walking, the the impact might seem like it's not such a good thing, but you can actually adapt to that and get stronger through that weight bearing exercise. And then maybe you can handle it with less discomfort over time. Amazing advice. Thank you so much, Travis, um, for all your Thank time you, today and doing this. I, I mean, I think this works for everybody from beginners to intermediates. And I know we didn't have any advance live on the webinar, but there might be some that watch back. And I think this can be helpful for everybody. So huge. Thank you to you. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah. And um, for everybody else, thank you for joining us. A couple like last minute plugs that I just want to put out there um, before we sign off. Let me share my screen so you can see them. Um, so just some super quick um, upcoming events. We have some things over the next month as we go through the holidays. Um, if you want to go support our men's basketball team, they will be playing in New York, New York, um, during the men's basketball um, Harlem Renaissance Classic. So we'll have a really fun reception pregame and then go over together and watch the game. So you're welcome to sign up for that. And then we'll be having two holiday events um, around the Philadelphia area, the first being in New Hope, Pennsylvania, and we'll be over at Peddler's Village for a really fun brunch. And we'll hear a talk about shopping local for the holidays on December 3rd. And then we'll be having our annual alumni holiday with the Philly Pops here in the city. And that will be on December 7th. Um, so be sure to go to jefferson.edu forward slash alumni events to get more information on these events and to register. Um, you can also sign up for our Jefferson Alumni Network. If you'd like to connect with alumni in your area, in your field of work, or in from those who studied the same thing. And you can find us at alumni network.jefferson.edu. My Last couple things, we are recording this session, so we'll send out the link um, as soon as that's on YouTube, and we'll also share the links that Travis provided, but there is still time tonight. It's it's still Rams Rise Up, so if you'd like to support our athletes, um, please go to jeffersonrams.com forward slash Rams Rise Up. Again, that's jeffersonrams.com forward slash Rams Rise Up. Just wanted to make that last plug. You can pick the team of your choice and, and help us um, get to our goals there. So huge thank you to everybody again for participating in this. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Take care.